Good afternoon. Uh, lunch was indeed good. I enjoyed it very much. And um, I have a ton of slides to throw at you uh, with some quite technical um, stuff. So I won't delay and I'll sort of jump straight in. I thought what was interesting um, this morning with Celine was, you know, Celine was talking about this sort of crisis of leadership. And that's a, it's a personal thing, it's a societal thing, it's also a political thing. Um, but I, for me, it's also a systemic uh, challenge. It's a systemic issue as well. So it's about the institutions and the structures that we create, which either enable or facilitate this sort of negative mode of leadership. And so really what I'm interested to talk about today is the, is the systems level and how we can use digital strategy and leadership to design better institutions and better organizations that inhibit uh, negative leadership. So as Samuel said, you know, I've been uh, sort of running around helping organizations with transformation, with the use of digital, with social tools for many, many years. And although I like to work on the ground and I like to work with technology, we've really been forced to sort of move up the food chain and really deal with the leadership barriers, blockers, and problems that prevent that transformation from happening. So this year, I will probably be doing sort of individual face-to-face -face training and education with about maybe 800 or 1,000 senior leaders in large organizations, um, simply because it's the only way I know that I can start to unblock uh, this situation and enable change to happen further down the organization. Um, and so I wanted to share with you this afternoon some of the techniques um, that we've been using that seem to work and some ideas about how we, can, uh, how we can do this. So we talked about the crisis of leadership. I think what's interesting in business and organizations is that crisis of leadership is very much about management theory. You know, if you go back to Taylor um, and you go back to the origins of, of management theory and management consulting, it's really all about the idea of taking a feudal class structure and applying that to industrial era organizations. So they try and prove that there's a special class of managers who are the ones that have the brains to tell us what to do, and the rest of us use our hands, and we're workers, and we do what we're told. And the whole theory of sort of you know, management education, management systems, and leadership as we know it today is really predicated on this bad idea. It was a bad idea even when Taylor was falsifying his data um, but in those days, we had no communication infrastructure. The only way we could coordinate organizations was using the telegraph. Today, in my pocket, I've got more technology than IBM had for half the 20th century, and so we simply don't need this situation or this solution to coordinating work and communications. Um, there's a really good book uh, about the history of the management consulting industry by Matthew Stewart called The Management Myth. And he tells a series of you know, really funny stories, actually, about um, how these myths came to exist and how broken the whole sort of management consulting uh, sector is. But I think you know, one of the problems we've got is that the institutions we designed in the 20th century assumed that managers would do the right thing. So if you look at the United States, there's an incredible system of political checks and balances, but the one thing they never predicted was that a criminal reality TV star backed by Russia would end up in the White House. So the only mechanism left is impeachment, and that's a very blunt instrument. Um, same in the UK. You know, in, in many of our large corporates that have failed, when they fail, you see a faceless accountant uh, come before the television who was paid four million a year and was taking bonuses even when the car had crashed and was sliding off the road towards a wall. You know, these people have no shame, um, and they are enabled and facilitated in doing what they do by the structures that exist uh, to regulate the behavior of others. So for me, it's an institutional problem, and it's a systems design challenge to create institutions that put leaders and managers back in their box, um, use their skills where they have skills, but also enable the rest of us, um, who are no longer serfs, by the way. You know, we actually have some brains of our own to get on and run uh, the organization. And I think, I'm an optimist, so I do think that you know, digital is actually a very good starting point for building these new um, institutions. So if you talk to Gary Hamill, uh, he will say, you know, your, your company today has 21st century internet processes, mid 20th century management theory, that's what I was talking about, 
all built on top of 19th century principles. The idea of cascading hierarchy as the only way of connecting uh, the work of all the people below within the organization. And it's this system which has educated generations of managers, and we no longer need it. And to a large extent, we also no longer need them. Um, because we have bots, we have automation, we have basic AI and machine learning that can do the job of, is the sales number bigger or smaller than the target? If no, go into a room and tell somebody off like a child and tell them next month things can be better. That's a very simple algorithm, right? And we can automate the hell out of that. And so we're going to lose an entire layer of middle management. And I think what we need to do is focus on the ones who have enough uh, skills and brains at the top to actually uh, really force them, I think, to rethink their role, but also to play a very important generational role in redesigning the institutions that sit underneath them. So for me, a lot of the education work that I do is about teaching not just organizational design, but organizational architecture principles to both senior leaders and emerging leaders. Because I think there's a lot of very good uh, literature, there's a lot of very good techniques that can teach them some very important things about how they can begin to take control of the sort of you know, need for change and the change agenda within their organizations. Because in all the sessions that I do, you know, people don't disagree with what we're saying here today. They just actually don't know how to do it, right? And they are as much a prisoner of the KPIs and the short-term stock price movements and the 8% net you know, cost reduction year on year as we are. And they also are very busy. So they just find it very hard to stop, pause, and think about what they should be doing as leaders. And I think that's one of the challenges that, um, that we try and address. Because, you know, within any organization, I mean, look at the, you know, great moonshot projects like the Apollo missions and so on. People can do anything when they want to, when they're supported, and when they're connected with each other. They can, they can do miracles. You know, people are very resourceful individuals if we get out of the way and let them do it. But actually what we have within organizations is a sort of learned helplessness, you know? So we, we treat people like children, uh, we tell them just to follow the rules, and then we wonder when they can't even use Outlook properly, right? So at home, people are you know, downloading an Android, uh, a Unix distribution, they're using 10 apps to communicate with their kids and their grandkids. You put them in a work setting, and if you change even the simplest digital tool, they sort of put their hand up and say, I need training, you know? Oh my goodness, this is different, what do I do? And that's the sort of helplessness culture um, that is a really big blocker to change, and we really need to help people and challenge people uh, to do better than that. But this is not just a culture problem, you know? We can't sort of work out loud or self-help circle our way out of this problem, yeah? There's nothing leaders would like more than for us to spend our time sitting in circles, holding hands, having nice conversations, because we're not challenging power, and we're not changing anything. We're changing ourselves, and guess what? We're not the problem, yeah? It's the system that produces this culture and behavior, which is the problem and should be the target of our change efforts. So, um, a few sort of ideas on, you know, how we try and approach this. I think there are four very simple sort of layers of digital leadership that we can start to address and think about, you know, very simply and very quickly. First of all, Mr. McChief, um, in your cable link um, organizational chart, well, you know, Mr. McChief needs to give a lot of power back to the organization because guess what? He's not an AI expert, so why the hell is he making decisions on, on, on technology? You know, he's probably not even a people or culture expert, so why don't we leave Mr. McChief setting direction, strategy, and looking at competition and markets, and everything else he needs to hand to the rest of us within the organization. So we need people like Peter Change, you know, the, the newly appointed uh, sort of change guy in cable link, they're the people that need to step up and take some of that power and also be given some of that power to act in a meaningful sense. But if you look at digital, one of the problems with digital is that actually, yes, you might have a CIO or a you know, head of IT, but you actually have a load of other digital stakeholders as well. So you've got marketing spending money and, and building software, you've got you know, internal comms, you've got all these different functions. And these guys are used to being divided. They only come together at the C-suite meetings when they fight each other for budget and power 
and attention from the CEO. What we really need is to sort of get them together in the room, around the table, 24 seven, so that we can coordinate digital strategy and digital development with everybody who is a key stakeholder in that area. So one of the key things we do is we sort of force organizations to create digital leadership groups. We force them to be connected all the time on Slack or Microsoft Teams. And we force them to actually put some rigor and some structure behind their investment decisions. Because it's actually amazing how many people are buying you know, really poor software in organizations just to spend the money, scratch an itch, but none of it's connected. None of it adds up to anything, right? So we need to start joining this together and actually building some coordination um, around that work. So I, for me, you know, don't go out and hire the all-powerful chief digital officer. Instead, bring all of your stakeholders together and make them a powerful function with a mandate to coordinate digital strategy and digital development. And then you need to work outwards from these people. They need a whole network of change agents, digital guides, digital passionates, who can actually do the work and take the, the messaging and take the ideas into the organization. Loads of case studies, whether it's sort of Bosch, whether it's Harold Schirmer at Continental, you know, some of you guys have also pioneered this stuff as well. It's a really powerful tool. Um, so anyone who really wants to sort of get involved, be a bit of a volunteer, they can work with this digital leadership group and they can be the eyes and the ears. You know, in, in, if you look at uh, Stanley McChrystal's you know, Team of Teams book, that's pretty much that strategy um, you know, writ large. Send them out into the organization, make them help people, but also gather intelligence, gather information, and bring that stuff together. And then the wider, the widest of these concentric circles is obviously the entire workforce. Um, Dave Snowden of the Kinefin Institute talks about the human sensor network. You know, everyone's connected on an intranet or a social platform or Slack or Teams or whatever it might be. That's your sensor network, yeah? They can give you temperature readings. They can tell you what's working, what's not working. They can help guide the digital strategy. And that needs to be an ongoing process. Um, we need the feedback, uh, the feedback and the input in order to know uh, what's working. So I'm very much in favor of this sort of distributed, you know, concentric circles approach to owning and running a digital strategy. Um, but the thing is, you know, how does this um, create and capture value for the organization? In other words, what should we be doing with this structure? And I think that's the next, uh, the next question. One of my favorite uh, Buckminster Fuller quotes is, um, you know, you basically sort of paraphrasing, you don't uh, fight the existing order, you create a new order. And so any change program or transformation effort in an organization today is not or should not be aimed at changing everybody because everybody is not changeable, nor do they want to be changed. Find the willing ones, uh, find those with a pulse, uh, and find those who actually want to put some effort in and move towards the new organization, and then allow the new organization to emerge from the old. And then you bring enough of the old with you uh, to give it some, uh, some heft. So what's interesting for me is that we need to do this in a system. You know, we need to move beyond what I think of as sort of intelligent design model of organizations. You know, you have gods on top who, you know, direct the design of everything below them. You know, we know that that's nonsense. We know that evolutionary systems are the most powerful things um, in the world um, in, in every level and in every domain. So we need to start creating an e evolutionary system. I would say the existing system of the organization is almost like a machine made of humans, if that makes sense. It's neither machine-like nor human. It's somewhere in the middle. We're sort of, you know, it's a machine made of meat. And what we really need is a better automated machine on top of which humans can be fully themselves, fully human, and creative and do the work. So we need a little separation uh, between the sort of back-end functions of the organization and the human value-creating front-end uh, functions. And what we, you know, the way we describe this challenge is it's about creating an organizational operating system. Uh, you know, we know that software 15, 20 years ago was this terrible vertically integrated thing and it either worked or it didn't work and you would sort of throw it away. These days, software is a series of layers, you know? Interfaces, layers, data, and it's all changing all the time. So you, you look at Facebook. The underlying data platform of Facebook changes very infrequently, but the interface is changing every day, you know? The whole thing is like a living system, and that's the way that we need organizations uh, to function, in my view. So I am arguing uh, a lot, as you can probably tell, that the current generation of leaders, this is their only job. They need to create a legacy to become heroes for history 
by doing the hard work of changing the organization in quite a dramatic way to create that operating system uh, for the future. Now, the basic model is really simple. The basic model is just platforms plus services. You know, everything we use from my car, my television, my phone, everything has a core platform that manages underlying services very conservatively. Safety, security, compliance, all that stuff is baked into the core platform, but it supports infinite variety of apps and services on top. And for me, that's the architectural model um, that, we need to, that we need to think of here. Um, if you look at one of the best case studies in the literature, the Chinese company Haya, and many books and articles written about it, you know, that's their structure. Leaders are sort of servants, you know, setting the frame, supporting the system. In the middle is their shared services platform, and then on top, the value creating functions who are working with, uh, you know, working directly with customers. So it's, it's an inverted pyramid supported by a platform. And I think that model is, you know, undeniably um, present in most high scale exponential organizations today. And so that's what we need to transition our way towards. We have the digital workplace. That's one layer, um, although you know, God knows why it's taken us 10 to 15 years to, to get to first base and invent Microsoft Teams and Slack. It's sort of crazy. But you know, we have something to work with. We have some connective tissue that joins people together in the organization. So you know, we're, at least, uh, we're at least started. But for me, um, what's interesting is when you start to go through every team in the organization, and think about what they do as a service. Not a series of processes or instructions, but a service. Let them own a microservice within the organization, whether that's something simple like a utilization calculator or a pricing calculator or a service for customers. Then you can end up with the sort of Amazon-style catalog of services, all of which are standardized, none of which can be adapted or changed. But boy, from an evolutionary point of view, you can pull together five or six of those and you can very quickly create something incredibly powerful. And that, for me, is, is another lesson of evolution. When you have lots of individual components or services pursuing their own fitness function, then join them together in an ecosystem, and what you get is a system that's greater than the sum of its parts. You get quite powerful effects um, going on in those systems. So, um, yeah, very briefly, where do we get started? Well, uh, one method that we teach leaders is start with an analysis of your market, your opportunities, your threats, what's changing on the outside that demands you to improve or to change, and then start considering, well, how does that impact on our services and our capabilities as an organization inside? So maybe we know there's a capability we're missing, maybe we've got some capabilities that are underused, but the purpose of digital is to create business capabilities. It's not just to have features or nice things like blockchain for donkeys or whatever people are obsessing about in the literature this week. You know, it's about business capabilities that can be scaled through digital. That's really what it's about. So we do something very simple, which is we ask people to sort of define those target capabilities in a way that normal humans can understand. Um, so using the format of a sort of agile user story, we need to do this in order to do this because this. Um, and then, you know, you've got a bunch of simple techniques like Alex Osterwalder's uh, value proposition canvas or the business model canvas. Loads of ways of thinking about, well, is this going to work? Is this a good idea? Should we be doing this? And if it passes that test, then you can start to think about increasing or improving the sort of capability set, the portfolio of capabilities that the organization has. And that's when you can start to think, okay, if we're doing this sort of you know, market trend scanning analysis on the outside, what people, skills, services, data, software products, et cetera, do we need in order to support that, uh, that new capability? And then you've got actionable goals for digital development coming out of a strategic priority. And that's when you can hand it over to the organization and say, hey guys, how do we do this? How do we make this thing? How do we deliver this new capability or this new service? And that, I think, is how you start to actually make this real um, and start to create some actionable outcomes from, uh, from strategy. Of course, it's not all about technology. There are human level capabilities we need to develop as well, whether they're skills, sort of behaviors, ways of working, or, or whatever. It's not just about the tech. But the key thing is you then turn that into an agile improvement loop. You know, you, you sort of do something, reflect on it, measure it, review it, and do something else. And that, if you start to spread it through those concentric circles of the digital leadership group, the guides, and the rest of the organization, that starts to create some action. Um, and then it's easier to guide. Now, in terms of how you put it into practice, uh, we tend to look at three levels. 
what we call digital optimization, which is doing what we already do a bit better with digital tools. So that's where the digital workplace comes in, where digital learning and skills and so on. Then you look at, okay, how can we transform what we do? So actually it's no longer just a car with a little uh, hybrid engine. This is a fully electric vehicle like the Tesla X. Um, and that's when you can actually start to redesign processes. You can turn things from processes into services and you can begin automating and orchestrating the work of the organization within their teams. And then finally, with all of these wonderful sort of services and capabilities, you can then point innovators uh, who are working with customers at creating entirely new products and services out of those very same components. And so I think those three levels are definitely three very important levels for us to be, uh, to be focused on and, and working. And this is where the digital leadership group comes back in because they need to sort of hold the ring and manage like a big backlog of potential actions that can, that can create this, uh, this digital development. And I think that's a challenge for them today. But if you look at the rise of sort of agile thinking and agile management thinking in organizations, this is becoming pretty much the new normal in terms of the way things are done. Even Gartner has sort of adopted the agile principles. HBR is saying this is the new normal for management. It's all about agile development. But you need to focus it on doing something practical that's good for the organization. And so that's why I've tried to uh, communicate that, uh, that sort of approach. The, the problem here is, you know, fake agile. So it's actually quite easy to persuade leaders, agile, 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 and say, okay, I get it. What you mean is I take my instructions, I put them on post-it notes and put them on the wall. I get it, okay, fine. And so we've worked with large companies where literally they run agile management processes by just putting the instruction of the boss on post-it notes on a wall. And everyone goes, okay, thank you. And they go away and, and they, it's just so stupid, I can't even, uh, I used to fly like two hours across Europe for that once a week and then it was just um, beyond belief. So what you've got to do is not have these little islands of agile, you know, or pretend agile. You actually have to go all in, yeah? You have to say, this is the way we improve anything, whether it's a machine, you know, whether it's a process or whether it's the organization. It's about having goals, breaking it down into small pieces, being absolutely customer focused and customer centric and then just iterating and iterating and iterating. And that is a really powerful evolutionary force um, if you do it right. Some people say, you know, if you do agile in this way, it's basically continuous design. You know, that's really what you're doing. So you're sort of teaching um, your leaders and, and your managers to be organizational designers, to be sort of systems uh, and service designers at the same time because, you know, the best customer experience comes from the best employee experience. And so you really need to be focusing on employees as your customers uh, for the management system that you create. And I think if you do that, then there's a chance of moving things forward and creating some uh, momentum. So for me, I think just to close, you know, everything is digital. And so digital leadership is leadership. Um, and I think, you know, digital strategy is strategy. There's no separation. There's no strategy over here and digital strategy over here. Everything is now uh, effectively digital organizational strategy and change is a constant. So we need to make agile methods something we teach to our leaders um, and we also need to make them into organizational architects and service designers who can serve the people who work in the organization uh, better. But at the same time, we have to help shape their roles. We have to put them back in the box and allow them to do what they're good at but not allow them to decide everything which is way beyond their scope of understanding or training or education. And we need to do the reverse. We need to get people to step up and actually take power, get on with things and do things in the middle of the organization, in particular, you know, the change agents, um, if we are to sort of shift that balance in a, in a meaningful uh, way. And I think my hope is that if we can do that, then there is, uh, there is some hope. So I hope you might all engage with some of that and maybe even try and get yourself fired uh, by putting it into practice. No, of course I won't get you fired. Um, but you know, it's, it's, worth, it's worth a shot to try and shape digital leadership and strategy in the organization rather than wait for it to be, uh, to be given to you. So thank you, I'm sorry if I'm slightly over time. Signing up.